Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're looking at neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that are produced and released by neurons, and they can either have an excitatory or inhibitory effect. Now, if we look at a neuron that's releasing a neurotransmitter, it releases it into this gap. This gap's called a synapse, and it's the gap between one neuron and the next neuron. Now, neurotransmitters that will bind to the next neuron will either excite it to send a signal or inhibit it from sending a signal. Now, neurotransmitters don't just bind to neurons. They may also bind to tissues. They could bind to muscles, they could bind to cells or glands, they can bind to multiple different, what we call effectors, something that will elicit some sort of change. Now, there's over 100 different types of neurotransmitters in the body. In this video, we're just gonna go through some of the most common, including acetylcholine, noradrenaline and adrenaline, which is also termed norepinephrine and epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, glutamate, and substance P. Now, in order for these neurotransmitters transmitters to have their effect, they must bind to specific receptors. And depending on that receptor, it could excite or inhibit that target organ, gland, neuron, whatever it may be. All right, so let's first start with acetylcholine. Acetylcholine has two major types of receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. Now, depending on what it wants to do, depends on the receptor. So for example, in our peripheral nervous system, remember our nervous system is divided into the central brain spinal cord and peripheral, all the nerves that shoot out and away and come back in to the brain spinal cord. In the peripheral nervous system, acetylcholine plays a really important role in skeletal muscle contraction, meaning muscles attached to our bones will not contract, allowing us to consciously move without acetylcholine. Now, the specific receptor involved here is muscarinic receptors, all right? Which means you can have certain drugs that we can use that can act on muscarinic rece receptors that can affect the way we move our muscles. Acetylcholine also plays an important role in the autonomic nervous system, specifically the parasympathetic division. This is the rest and digest. In actual fact, the autonomic nervous system, which is sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest, they both use acetylcholine, but the parasympathetic uses acetylcholine at every single neuron, all right? The sympathetic only uses it from the first neuron. Now, if we just look at the, the parasympathetic, we've got the first neuron and the second neuron. That second neuron then sends a signal and talks to the target effector. It could be a muscle, it could be a gland, it could be a cell type, whatever it may be, all right? Now, usually it's gonna be the digestive system or the heart or the pupils or the salivary glands. This is the parasympathetic. Acetylcholine is released at every single point, all right? So it's very important in rest and digest. But in the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, plays an important role in memory and co cognition has, and has been implicated in Parkinson's disease, which is the most common movement disorder, and Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common neurodegenerative disorder as well. All right, let's now look at the catecholamines. Catecholamines is an umbrella for noradrenaline, adrenaline, and dopamine. All of these three neurotransmitters are produced by the amino acid tyrosine, which we must get from our diet. We can't produce ourselves. Well, we can produce it from phenylalanine, but we need to get phenylalanine from our diet as well. Now, there's, when we look at noradrenaline and adrenaline, all right, there's a couple of different receptors that are used. You can have alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, beta-3. Let's ignore beta-3 because they're only found on fat cells and we don't actually have any drugs that really utilize this receptor and its function. Let's look at alpha-1 and beta-1. If noradrenaline or adrenaline binds to these receptors, it's excitatory, okay? For example, what you'll find is alpha-1 is found on our blood vessels, for example. So when noradrenaline binds to alpha-1, blood vessels will constrict, increasing blood pressure. Beta-1 is found in our heart. When noradrenaline binds to it, increases the heart rate, increases the contractile force of the heart. You'll find that alpha-2 and beta-2 are inhibitory. Alpha-2 is found on the postsynaptic neuron, so that's the second neuron, and what it does is it auto-regulates the sympathetic nervous system. It stops the sympathetic nervous system from firing off any more signals. So it's like a negative feedback system. Beta-2, if noradrenaline binds to, this is found at our lungs and it opens the airways up so more air can come in and out. Now, in the central nervous system, adrenaline and noradrenaline are important for opioid release. This is our endogenous opioid system. So you know opioids are there to relax, reduce pain, anxiety. This is involved in opioid release, adrenaline, noradrenaline. In the, para, uh, in the peripheral nervous system, sorry, Noradrenaline and adrenaline are the primary neurotransmitters for the sympathetic nervous system. So acetylcholine, important for the parasympathetic. Noradrenaline, important for the sympathetic. If we look at another catecholamine, dopamine, 
probably heard of this as our reward molecule, our feel-good mo molecule. Well, it does play a role in all of these. Two major types of dopamine receptors, uh, dopamine 1, dopamine 2. If you bind to dopamine 1, it excites, it's an excitatory um, signal. And if it's dopamine 2, then it's going to be an inhibitory signal. And dopamine is involved in heaps of different stuff. In the central nervous system, motivation, okay, reward, very important, and motor control. It's found in a deep part of the brain called the basal ganglia, and it's involved in initiating motor movement and smoothing out motor movement. Now, in people with Parkinson's disease, the, the neurons that make dopamine are dying off, which means it's hard for them to initiate movement and also hard for them to smooth movement out, so they get that resting tremor, postural instability, and shuffling gait. In the peripheral nervous system, dopamine plays a role in blood vessel diameter, GIT motility, and also the kidney's role in uh, being able to excrete sodium as well. Serotonin, all right, serotonin is also known as 5-HT, couple of different types of serotonin receptors. Now serotonin receptor one and five is inhibitory. Serotonin receptors two, three, four, six, and seven is excitatory. And it plays an important role in the central nervous system with sleep and mood, but also in the peripheral nervous system plays a role in our GIT. If serotonin is released by neurons in our gut, that's right, we've got neurons in our gut that release serotonin, it stimulates the gastrointestinal tract to contract and push things through. Too much pushes it through far too quickly. And it also plays a role, role in bone remodeling. It may make bones stronger, it may make bones weaker, depending on the situation. So that's serotonin. Now GABA, also known as gamma aminobutyric acid. GABA has two major types of receptors, GABA A, GABA B. Predominantly, GABA is the main inhibitory neuron of the nervous system. So it inhibits neurons from firing off, that's its major role. And in certain disorders like epilepsy or individuals that have seizures, the drugs that may be given may stimulate GABA. Because if you stimulate it, increase the amount in the system, what it does is it stops neurons from firing off, usually by throwing negative chloride into the cells. If the cells become super negative, called hyperpolarization, they won't fire off. Now glutamate is actually the most common or most abundant excitatory neuron in the nervous system. Two major types of receptors, NMDA and AMPA, and again, excitatory if stimulated, and they will tell neurons to fire off. You can have glutamate toxicity. Too much glutamate being released can actually kill brain cells and has been implicated in dementia. That glutamate toxicity theory has been associated with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. All right, the last one I wanna talk about is substance P. Substance P, P for pain. This is involved in the pain system. The major type of receptor here is NK1, and again, it's excitatory. Anytime you experience pain, painful stimulus, it may be emotive, it may be physical, all right? What is gonna happen is substance P is released, and in the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, stimulate pain and inflammation. So therefore, sometimes we wanna try and identify certain drugs that maybe we can use against substance P to help mitigate pain. So this is a relatively quick run through of some of the most common types of neurotransmitters.